Hello, and welcome to Film Slam Stream's post-film conversation for one small visit. My name is Eric Seiler, and I'm an instructor of film, media arts, and communications, as well as moderator for this conversation. We are very pleased to be joined by the writer and director of this film, Joe Chim. Joe is um, is a, a, is joining us actually from Hong Kong. So I know there's a bit of time difference. I'm so glad that you are bright and alert with us. Hello, Joe. And welcome. <laughs> hi, hi. It's only 9 p.m., so I'm still okay. <laughs> okay, well, great, great. I, I'm just glad that you're able to um, be here with us. What, what a... What a what a film! I mean, it says it's a piece of history. It's a piece of history. Basically, that's what it is. I had no oh. knowledge about, and I'm sure many viewers did it also. So, tell us, how did you come across this piece of history and decide to put it on film? Um, so it's actually a very personal story because the baby in the film, um, Anisha, is Anisha Abraham, uh, is one of my best friends. And so she told the story to me um, over a dinner party, actually, oh gosh, in 2010, 2011, I can't remember. And it kind of always stayed with me. Um, but, you know, you hear a story and it kind of, you know, I just thought it was so beautifully beautiful and it was the serendipity was just so amazing. But it wasn't until 2018 that I visited her again. <clears throat> this time she moved to Amsterdam and somehow we started talking about the story and I was asking her so many questions that she finally said, well, you just talk to my mother <laughs> because she'll give you all the details. So I called up Auntie Nirmala, who in the movie is the young mother. Um, and she, you know, just told me the story over WhatsApp in, in like two and a half hours. And as she was telling me the story, I just felt it like play before my eyes, especially the two scenes of the women walking down Main Street America and their saris in 1969. And also the, the idea of this dripping ice cream that I kept coming back to in my head. Um, and so eventually I thought, you know, I started off with a short story, but then eventually I thought, you know, I think a film would be a better medium for this, you know, visually rich, um, charming story. And I just thought it was too good not to share it with the rest of the world. That is great. So and you two, um, just over a casual conversation, you decided to make this film. And uh, so well, what happened next? You heard this and you and I know you're, you know, uh, what did you do next? Did you decide to hire a producer, find actors, location? Yeah. What happened next? Yeah, so it took me a while. I think my very first draft was uh, Christmas 2018. Um, and then, then I, it wasn't quite there. And it wasn't until, um, you know, I live in Hong Kong. There was, I work full time. And so I had a full time job. I have kids, I have teenagers. And so it wasn't until the pandemic hit and, um, and the protests that we had a bunch of protests in Hong Kong, and then the pandemic. And I think it was, and then George Floyd happened. And, and I remember August of 2020, that really affected me. Um, and also it was the beginning of these anti-Asian hate incidents that we were seeing. And I think all of that kind of all converged in my head. And I thought this was a really good chance for me to explore issues of racism and belonging and identity, issues that I always, I've always grappled with um, and been fascinated with. And, and so I finally wrote a draft that I was happy with in I think August, late August, 2020. And I sent it around. And at the time I actually had, a, a, through a connection, got a big name actress who was very happy to um, sign on to play the mom or the grandmother. And that really encouraged me. And then we pitched it around. And then at one point I realized, you know, if I sell this to the people they were asking me to sell it to, I would just be the writer. Uh, and I wouldn't have any choice over the cast or the crew or any of that. And, and to be honest, I didn't really write this for myself to direct. I wrote it for another friend to direct. But, but when it came down to it, I realized, oh my gosh, if I just sold this off, I would have no control. And so in the end, I decided, you know what, I'm going to direct this. And through another, some other friends who encouraged me, they're like, you have all the experience. Um, you just need to assemble the right team. And so in December 2020, uh, I started, we were initially going to go down the Kickstarter route um, and, and get funding through friends and family. 
And by June of 2020, I made a pitch video, like a four minute a pitch video to kind of explain, you know, that we were going to put it on Kickstarter and all that. And then by March or June of 2021, we had gotten enough money from friends and family that I didn't even have to go down the Kickstarter route. Like just it was, all it became privately funded. And, and, you know, you've seen it. It's a half hour film. It's a very long film, a uh, short. And it's, it's, I always wanted to make it for streaming and, and so that it wasn't just for festivals. And, and so I, I decided to keep it the length that was. Um, most festivals find it too long, <laughs> uh, but I kind of felt it was more like a TV episode. I, I kind of shot it that way, and I, and I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to hold back on the production design or the the details and the period piece. And so it costs more than most short films do. But, but I, I was like, you know, go big or go home. And so yeah. I, I wanted to really just put all that money on the screen. Exactly, and. <clears throat> We, it's something that we had to actually live. I, I actually felt like I was back in 1969 and Aww. I enjoyed the way you created little subtle tensions here and there. Oh, what's going to happen when they go into the rest to the restaurant? And, and <laughs> oh, what happened when the man walks up to the car? And, and we just knew that at the end, everything was okay. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, that yeah. was really um, good. So let, let's talk about the production itself. Yeah, actors, where did you find yeah. them? Um, 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 well, I used to be an actor myself, mm -hmm. and so a lot of it was just through word of mouth and people who had worked with other people and recommendations. And um, most of them were theater actors, but you know, two of them, I I don't know if you know the movie of uh, the TV series um, Kim's Convenience. It was quite popular in on Netflix a few years ago. So Alora, who plays a grandmother, and uh, Gabby, who plays uh, Auntie Normala. Uh, they were both stars on Kim's Convenience. So I saw them through that. And that's a, it was a very popular Netflix show um, back in 2020, 21, two or three years ago. So I knew their work through that show. And through Connections, I found them. And then, um, and the only person I had to, had real difficulty finding was the little girl, the baby. So we hired a casting agent for that. But everybody else was just through word of mouth and auditions and yeah. So with the baby, did you have to use a twin or you just had to? No, we had one baby. Okay. <laughs> it was hard enough to find, you know, uh, uh, an Indian baby at that age. Yeah. You know, who and it, we and all keep in mind we shot during COVID. So a lot of parents were very, very oh, right. um we, we shot between variants. We shot at the end of 2021. So COVID was still happening and it was a COVID set. So we were all masked and, and so a lot of it was really hard to find parents who were willing to, you know, have their babies or children come on set. But mm -hmm. we had an amazing cast director who ended up finding Rosie, little Rosie. And at the time she was only 18 months old and and she was amazing, but she wasn't a twin. And like you said, usually you like on a professional production, you right. use a twin so you can switch them out, but we didn't. And that was kind of one of the challenges we had with the film because we, in a lot of scenes I had to rewrite because Rosie as good as she was you know was working like eight hour days or she wasn't like she she was there much longer than she should have been and you know she was a little baby and so there were times when she just couldn't do it she was right. just too tired and and so there were many scenes where I ended up having to write her out of it or cut around her or every time she you know the cast is so amazing it was such a loving family loving Zen and every time she grumbled or was you know was um was sad or irritable or wanted her mommy the cast would jump in and sing you know the wheels on the bus go round and round round and round so I wanted to all these excerpts of the cast just joining in to make sure she was comfortable and um and so for those of you who have seen the film the the finally on the like day I don't know what day um the scene in the diner is actually really funny because her aunt was there and she said, you know, why don't we put on Peppa Pig? 
And so they put on Peppa Pig on the mobile phone and we actually stuck it behind this sugar canister. And that was on the dining room table in the diner. And uh, and that was what kept her attention. <laughs> We're like, oh my God, if we'd only discovered Peppa Pig earlier, <laughs> we would have played that earlier. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. That one yeah. question with the um, baby. Um, yeah. How did you get her to wave? And did she just wave and you wrote that in about the queen uh, waving? Yeah, or yeah, how did that I, happen? I can't. You mean in the diner scene? In the yeah, diner she, scene, they got yeah, the baby she, to wave. <laughs> yeah, she, um, I think she was just following. She and the Laura, who played grandma, Elizabeth yes. George, and her had developed this really great relationship. And yeah, so she ended up just following following what we did she loved we loved her and she loved yeah. us and so we had a great relationship that was so cool i said how did they get her the baby to wait that's a natural yeah. born actress <laughs> she she was wonderful she was really i mean she must be about three now almost four oh my gosh two years uh, ago yeah three now three and a half she's probably almost four now a very different but that was the first time she'd ever been on screen and her mom was a dancer is a dancer so she, her mom is great and in certain scenes, her mom was actually holding her because she sure. really needed mommy. And we had to, like, cut her out. <laughs> we framed it very, very um, precisely so I could cut yeah. her, uh, edit around her. Yeah. So, so tell us a little bit of, about the research and development for this. Uh, I know you shot this in Canada. Did you come yeah. to Ohio? Uh, how did you yeah. work with your production designer? So give us a little bit of background information about getting this period piece um together well um you know now that google is around it's just amazing and so um the last photo you see of the the two families on the porch i had that photo and so just through um google research we could find out what 911 armstrong drive really looked like and so um, that's just through Google satellite. And so when we shot in Canada, the terrain in Canada where we were, it's only a four hour drive from Cleveland is very similar to Ohio. It's very flat. It's a lot of farm farmland. And so I knew I picked this area uh, outside of Hamilton, which is an hour from Toronto. In fact, a lot of Netflix shows are, are shot there. If you ever saw the Queen's Gambit or um, I think, Umbrella Academy, I think it's called, or, or that mm -hmm. one of those superhero shows. Um, they all take place in the 1960s because that was the a kind of uh, mid-century architecture, <clears throat> mid-century mid modern suburban houses. And so the architecture is very similar. And in fact, I made a trip to Wapakoneta last year after we shot the film. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is deja vu. Like, it's so similar to where we shot in, in Ontario. And, and so a lot of research was done via Google. Um, you know, I looked up Wapakoneta and um, I did a lot of research on the Armstrong family. I had the um, the Abrahams we had access, complete access to. And so we would interview with them a lot. But the Armstrong family, luckily, they have, a, you know, there's a lot on public record. And so I got to uh, um, really delve into that as well. And and just really did my research on the 1960s and 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 you know, um, and really learned a lot about that. One thing I did not learn or did not know until the movie when I was started writing it is I knew about the moon landing, but I didn't know about the world tour that uh, the subsequent world tour that the astronauts did afterwards. And I found that fascinating because in fact Neil Armstrong was just in India a few weeks before, like maybe two weeks before the family came to the door. And so um, <clears throat> and so that whole world tour, um, a nickname, the Giant Leap, was was done by uh, the behest of Richard Nixon. And um, and so that I found really fascinating. And again, there's so much, you know, you do a Google search and this all comes up. And, and so it was really, really uh, fascinating for me to do that. And then I had an amazing production designer who would research everything from what a car seat looked like in 1969, which we ended up making uh, in the in the movie, um, to, you know, what the dress was, was, you know, she was so intricate in her research. And so it was amazing to collaborate with her 
Um, at one point, even the light switches in the in the house that we rented, she switched out all those light switches so that they were vintage light switches from the era. And, she, and through Facebook market, she got like 1969 vacuum, Hoover vacuums and, you know, things that didn't even make it to the film. Uh, you know, the crib that they found, they found on um, Facebook market. And it was an actual vintage crib from the 1960s as well. So they, they did such a stunning job. Of, of, yeah, of they that. did. That's the set design, uh, you know you know, redecorating those houses, um, to mm -hmm. uh, both the houses, turning them into 1969 sets, you know, I'm yeah. sure people weren't actually, you know, living the house like that, so. Well, I, I, I gave my, I gave my locations at quite the, quite the task, because I could, I, I needed a, a house with the porch, because I saw that in the photo, and I knew what, that was what 912 Armstrong looked like, but at the same time, so I knew the original house. We re eventually went to see it a year later in Wapakoneta. It was just a, a small bungalow. Um, and so I said, I need a bungalow, but I also need a scene where he's coming downstairs. And so my location person was like, well, you can't have a bungalow and then not upstairs. And, and I'm like, I know, but I do, you know, maybe there's a split level or something. And somehow she ended up finding... She searched for two weeks and then lo and behold, this house that she found ended up being 30 seconds away from her. It was her neighbor's house. It had the same columns as the porch, but it was built in the 1960s. But in the 1990s, they added an extension. And so they had a whole upstairs wing and those stairs. And so I could do the Neil coming down the stairs shot as well um, with the, you know, the steps on the carpet and stuff because I really wanted to keep that in the same place as well. So somehow it just all, I mean, we kept saying Elizabeth George was was blessing us with, um, you know, finding all these amazing serendipitous um, locations. Oh, that's that's good. So mm -hmm. uh, real quick in a you know, few moments we have left, um, um, just tell us a little bit about the reception of the film. Yeah. How did the um, family receive it, did the Armstrong um, oh yeah, that's and, and... yeah, that's probably one of the things I'm proudest with. Um, so, uh, so first of all, it's really gone all over the world. It, it, even since um, we went to Cleveland, where we won the Audience Choice Award, we um, then went to New York and won and went nom was nominated for a short there. And we were then invited to NATO headquarters in May, and so we spoke at NATO and spoke to 32 ambassadors of NATO. But prior to that, we had, before we came to Cleveland, we had shown at, at NASA headquarters and the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum and their giant planetarium. And so it's it's just been really well received everywhere. And, um, but I think my most favorite story is that after we screened, we after we got in contact with the people at NASA, they unbeknownst to me sent the movie to uh, Neil Armstrong's youngest son, Mark. And so Mark Armstrong, uh, his wife and him loved the movie and his wife came up with this really wonderful idea of paying a return visit to the Abraham family. So on the day of the NASA screening, this is last September, uh, we all knew that, uh, that Mark was gonna come down, but Anisha's parents who are now 90 and 78 didn't know. And so they thought they were just hosting a breakfast for the cast and crew before we went to NASA. And so then Mark um, and and we flew Mark and, and uh, his wife down and they knocked on the door and the Abrahams opened the door and, and Mark said, you know, um, hello, my name is Mark Armstrong. I believe you met, uh, this is my wife, Wendy. I believe you met my grandparents and my father 53 years ago. And we'd like to return the visit and pay you one small visit. So uh -huh. it was, that was just like the, the most beautiful full circle moment and then we spent two hours at this breakfast before we all then went to NASA on screen with Mark and Mark did you film did you film it. that at all did anyone we film did that? we did oh, um I know I know I still have to do something with it um but we did film that moment it was it was such a I think that to me is my proudest of of what's come with all this you know it's all a film about connection and to know that we could link these families up again is is probably oh. what gives me the most joy that's a wonderful story. That's a film in itself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Joe, what, what's next for you? What, what can we expect to see from you next? 
<laughs> I'm working on a couple of stories. I think, uh, I, you know, I'm one of those really painfully slow writers that have to gestate and gestate. And, but then once it comes to me, it kind of all tumbles forth. And so, so I'm, I'm working with a few ideas, but I, I think um, one will maybe a personal one about me and my mother <laughs> that I'm thinking of working on. And then a couple of other stories um, about uh, maybe one in Hong Kong as well. So I have a few stories kicking about that I have to start doing next. Well, I, w I wish you all the best um, with uh, your upcoming projects or projects. And um, if it's anything like, um, you know, one small visit, we are in for a treat. Because I just like the way you take your time to really deliberately, you know, tell us a story. It's really great. I look forward to more yeah. work from you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hey, thank you. And thank you to our audience for joining us for this important and invigorating conversation. For more information about our upcoming film festival, please visit us at clevelandfilm.org. I'm Eric Seiler. Thank you. <laughs>